Hello team. Uh, today we're going to move on to uh, faults in lighting systems. This is our next topic. Uh, this is not a very long um, slideshow, so this video uh, won't be too long. I, I think I will do this in uh, in one one video, so there'll only be one for one lecture for this uh, for this topic. However, in saying that. Um, the videos, the YouTube videos on the Canvas page, the ones that we would normally watch in class, are um, are very good. There's, there's a couple in there that are that are really good. There's a US Air Force one that um, has some nice detail on uh, basic fault finding, uh, and a couple of other ones where uh, uh, Chad pulls apart some faulty components, which are quite interesting to watch. So I highly recommend that uh, you go and watch those videos. And since this one isn't too long, you should have plenty of time up your sleeve. Uh, there'll be a four-digit code for this topic, for the test in this topic. And the first two digits for that code are six nine. First two digits are six nine. Okay, getting straight into fault finding. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Obviously, um, a lot of what we do, a lot of what we talk about in class and a lot of stuff that we've done on this course is uh, highly focused around installation. And for the majority of electricians, that is what they do. They, they install things, you know, they uh, wire up houses, that kind of stuff. There is a subset of electricians, however, who uh, do repair, and, uh, and that is fault finding. Well, fault finding is the uh, is the critical component to uh, repair of equipment, right? So something breaks down, you have to figure out what is wrong with it, and then fix it. And and it's the figuring out what is wrong with it is the uh, is the most difficult part of that. And in my personal opinion, my most interesting part of it, uh, as I've alluded to in various uh, stories I've told and the discussions that we've had, my personal experience is not. Um, it's not heavily on the installation side of things. I have always been uh, far more involved in repair of equipment. Um, certainly uh, when I was in the army, um, generators, refrigeration, that kind of thing. Uh, after leaving the army in the fuel industry, in the fire industry. So um, fault finding and repair of, uh, of equipment is, is kind of my bread and butter. Uh, and in saying that, I think it is the most difficult part to me. It's it's far more difficult than uh, than the day to day, you know, uh, installing new switches, wiring up lights, sockets, that kind of stuff. To to me, that's pretty easy. I could teach someone how to do that. You know, wire a house in, in probably six months, and you'd be very competent. Uh, learning how how to fault find, and uh, and be good at that is is a much much bigger and deeper topic. Um, I mean, it's just understanding the fault finding process and, and being good at that is one thing, but then uh, building up a, a experience bank that um, if you come to a new piece of equipment that you've never seen before, that you can then apply uh, those skills that you have to that, to that situation, to that equipment, even though you've never, you've never had anything to do with it, to, um, to come up with... Uh, useful fault finding uh or to be able to to be able to fault find and repair that that piece of equipment is a, is a very very difficult uh skill and something that I, I take a great deal of pride in being able to do that uh it's, as i said it's one it's one thing to uh learn a specific piece of equipment and know everything about that and being able to fault find on that uh that that is a a, a skill in and of itself obviously but um uh being able to have general fault finding skills that are so well refined that you could then go to a piece of equipment you've never seen before and still be able to, yeah, you won't be as good as somebody who does it all the time, but um, still be able to fault find and repair something you've never seen before is, uh, I think that's, the, to me, that feels like the, the very highest end of, uh, of the art of electrical work. So let's have a look at that then. So um, first, what is the fault finding process? And, and this is really important to me. It's a very logical and step by step process. If you if you fail to um, approach fault finding in a logical fashion, then essentially you are um, you're fault finding randomly. And uh, fault finding randomly can work, but it will take you longer. Uh, and it will cost you money. It will cost you money in the long run to fault find 
randomly. So uh, I'll, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Let's have a look at this fault finding process. So we, we've um, refined that down to five steps here. Uh, people might put this in a different way or, or explain it in a different way, but at a very basic level this works. So our first step is gather information. Ask as many people as possible who were there, when and how the fault occurred. Now if it's just like the light's not working, I switched the light on and it didn't work, okay, th that is what it is. Uh, in some cases, uh, for example, again, working in the fuel industry, that, that um, gather information can be very important, particularly if it's an intermittent fault, because you may find that when you get there, uh, the fault is not occurring, or you, you can't make it happen again, you can't replicate it, so you're going to have to then fault find based on what other people have told you. So you want to know things like, well, when did it happen? Has it happened before? Is it, if it's an intermittent fault, is there a specific set of conditions that are happening that um, when that fault occurs, like has it only happened first thing in the morning is a good one in the fuel industry that's um, to do with temperature. If they say, oh, every, the first thing in the morning there's no pressure at the pumps, bang, straight away I know, okay, I'm looking for, um, I'm looking for a line leak because I've got some dermal contraction in the line. So I won't explain what that means, but again, if I, if I know that that condition is happening first thing in the morning, that tells me something different to if, they, if it happens randomly throughout the day. A uh, good one in general electrical work is, is happen when it rains. Okay, if it happens when it rains and then maybe a day later it seems to fix itself, uh, well then we're probably getting some water in something, right? And then it's drying out or, or draining out over time. Um, so getting that, that gathering of information is really important. Analyze information, decide the probable cause based on past experience and training. So that's where you then, you know, use that information. So I've already talked about, I'm, I'm talking about that as I go. So um, gathering information is finding out and then the analyze information is, well, what do I do with that? So as I said, if you, if they tell you, well, this happens every day, the light doesn't work every time it rains, the, the security light outside stops working every time it rains. Well, okay, uh, then my analyze information is, the information is uh, the security stop light, stop, the security light stops working when it rains. My analysis is there's probably water getting inside there. Uh, my next step will be investigate. Now attempt to find the fault from your analysis. So I'm going to go and have a look. Well, can I can I pull that apart? Get that light fitting open. Have a look inside it. See if there's any uh, if if there's water in there now, or if there's any indication that there has been water in there. So um, if it was let's say a fluorescent light, and uh, and I um, somebody said, well, it, you know flickers on and off and I go and have a look and I find that the tubes are um, burnt at the ends and then my analysis will be that or actually my analysis would be the flickering tube is probably uh, a faulty tube and my investigation will be go and have a look and then I find that the tube has uh, blackened and burnt ends okay yeah I'm pretty sure that the uh, the tube has is faulty now so that investigate part is then going to have a look um, go and have a look at the thing that I think is wrong after my analysis and, uh, and prove that it is faulty or not faulty. That, that process may be uh, more than once. You, you may have to go through, gather, analyze, and investigate more than once. Gathering information may also be you um, testing. Is there voltage here? Is there continuity here? Analyze that information. Well, if there's voltage here but no voltage here, then that component in the middle must be faulty. Investigate, well, have a look at that component. Test it if I can, if there's a way of testing it, uh, and replace it if I need to. Uh, next step is rectify, so that's where I replace that component that's faulty or replace the whole fitting if I need to, whatever it is. Um, that is finding the, uh, fixing the fault that I have found. And then testing is after I've, replaced it or fixed it then I'm testing it before I, I do testing to make sure it's safe before re-energizing and then after I've re-energized it turned it back on I test to make sure that it is operating correctly um, yeah so the, the 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 step that well the thing that underlies this is that multiple part process so um, there's a couple of things that I will talk about in this process that maybe aren't, aren't listed here is um Fixing or replacing things one at a time is really important because if I if I walked into a house and somebody said ah uh, the lights in the lounge don't work like, oh, okay let me have a look and I have a look okay I've got a a fuse and circuit breaker that looks like it's possibly faulty I'm not sure 
Uh, and there's a switch there, this one switch that controls all the lounge lights, that could be faulty. Or uh, well, there's, there's two lights in the lounge, the uh, lamps could be faulty. So if I replace that circuit breaker and the switch and the lights, and then I switch everything on and it works, which one was the fault? I don't know. Now that might sound stupid, and it is a bit stupid if you were to um, do your fault finding like that and replace everything straight away. Uh, that's a bit dumb, but uh, it can happen. And I, I get tempted by this all the time, you know, fault finding on a piece of equipment. You think, oh, it could be the board there, it could be the fuse, or it could be that uh, wire there is loose. And I'll fix all three of them, and then I'll switch back on. It works, and I, I don't actually know which one was the fault. So replace things one at a time and be logical about it. If I think it's this, replace that part. Test, yes it works, okay good it was that part. No, it does not work, okay now I'm looking somewhere else. S turn everything off, take out the new part that I put in, put the old part back in because that didn't do anything. Now find another thing that I think is faulty and replace that. Okay some fundamental faults or some standard faults. Loss of supply, so this is where Okay, somebody says, the thing doesn't work, the light doesn't work, the socket doesn't work, my oven doesn't work, whatever it is. Um, and we test it and find there's no voltage, there's no power at that, um, there's no power at that uh, appliance or, or light or whatever it is. So uh, what could it be? Uh, loose connection, trip circuit breaker, go and trip the circuit, check the circuit breaker, check the fuse at the switchboard. Check the internal fuses. If it's a, a stove and nothing's working on the stove but you've got power going into it, there's probably an internal fuse in that stove that is possibly tripped. It uh, could be a loose connection somewhere. So here now we're going to test uh, voltage. Where is the voltage? Where Are we getting voltage and where does voltage stop? If I can test on that circuit at the switchboard and go, yes, there is voltage there, and then I go to where the oven connects at the wall and I go yes there is voltage there but the oven doesn't work okay something internal on the oven if I test voltage at the switchboard and say yes there's voltage there but uh, there's no voltage at the uh, at the wall connection behind the oven okay the fault is somewhere between the switchboard and the uh, and the wall outlet uh, if I test voltage at the switchboard uh, at the circuit breaker and there's no voltage there okay then the fault is in the switchboard or maybe further back um, somewhere else uh, next one is earth fault that's pretty standard so we get a tripping circuit breaker if there is a low enough fault to earth that we get a high current we may trip a circuit breaker or an rcd will um rcd will trip so we can get that very low current uh, fault to earth and uh that will trip an rcd uh, Or when we switch the um, RCD or circuit breaker back on, it does not uh, stay on. It'll it'll either trip immediately or um, or trip again after a short period of time. Uh, we could get a dead short, so phase to neutral, phase to phase, uh, phase to phase being in a three phase system. Uh, so then we'll be looking at the protective device at the origin, so that's the circuit breaker at the switchboard. If we have a phase to neutral fault, then the circuit breaker or fuse or whatever it is should be tripped. Uh, and another one would be correct protective devices in place, uh, type B, type C, type D circuit breakers or type A RCDs. Probably the most, uh, that's, that's fairly unlikely um, because whoever's installed those should, should have... Um, install the right ones and if they didn't then it's likely that you're going to get that fault from day one um not you know two years later somebody's not going to ring you and say there's a fault with something and you find out the wrong circuit breaker was installed two years ago uh, but it is possible it's possible that you could get um if you don't use motor rated circuit breakers remember we've talked about um, a motor draws a high current um a high current at startup so we use uh type d circuit breakers that trip a little bit more slowly. They trip a bit more slowly so that they were not going to trip on that high current at startup. Um, if we don't use the right circuit breakers in that situation, we could we could be tripping circuit breakers on motor startup. A good indication there would be, well, every time I turn this thing on, then the whole circuit trips. And you go, ah, okay, well, that thing is drawing a high current. Uh, defective components, so switches, relays, contactors, etc., not functioning correctly. 
Uh, that is what it is if we find a, a faulty switch. A faulty switch is pretty common, particularly in a house, right? So the switch doesn't operate correctly. That's usually pretty easy to fault find, right? The, the customer will tell you that the switch is faulty. It doesn't switch on properly or um, it doesn't hold on, springs back or something like that. Um, and then we decide whether we're going to replace or repair. In most cases these days we'll replace, especially small components like that. But it's some some cases where we might repair something. Uh, even down on electronic circuit boards, you may remember when we built our... Um, when we built our... DC power supplies. Uh, I made a couple of repairs where we burnt tracks or um, we blew out blew out the tracks with our soldering irons on the back of our um, circuit boards. Uh, some cases I was able to repair those. So um, that's you know if you can spend ten minutes repairing something like that, that's obviously cheaper than replacing the whole thing. Uh, breakdown of control circuits, internal wiring, PCBs, and electronics. So um, electronic circuits, capacitors, resistors. Uh, inductors, diodes, all of the little bits and pieces on our electronic circuit boards can blow out. And again, there'll be a decision about replace or repair. If you can, if you can diagnose a fault down to the component, the individual component on a board, and you can procure a replacement and do that yourself, and it's not going to take too long, you know, then uh, you can do that. In most cases, you, you would swap out an electronic board. Uh, reverse polarity at supply origin uh, uh, at a single phase outlet uh, phase in neutral reversed or neutral and earth reversed or at a single fitting of phase in neutral maybe reversed we we'll do a live test versus dead test um, supply supply reversal coming into the house is a big problem because then we're going to get a live voltage on our earth because of our MEN link uh, if you find that you need to immediately contact someone who can deal with that like the power company uh, if it happens inside the house, then we could track that down and fix it ourselves. Uh, some initial faults and newly installed work, reverse polarity, discrimination, loose connection, protective devices, faulty portable equipment. Uh, note, this is not wear and tear. So this is important, and in most cases you'll find this. If you do a brand new installation, uh, it's not going to work 100% first time you'll switch it on and something's going to something's going to be off so that's one of the reasons why we do testing because it means that even if we don't get everything perfect the first time if we do accurate testing then we're going to find out ah oh, i've reversed the polarity on the socket accidentally or um this socket doesn't operate because i forgot to strip one of the wires and i've just screwed the screwed the terminal down on top of the insulation um so there can be multiple uh causes for that uh, but it is, a, it is a common thing and, and something that uh, makes it really important for us to do good fault finding. Uh, good fault finding, good testing, good testing on a brand new installation that we've just built. Uh, right, so lighting faults. So this unit was specifically about lighting faults, although if we can have good fault finding technique on lighting, we can do um, fault finding on anything really. So from a simple blown lamp to various wiring and lighting light fitting faults, to rodent damage and weather conditions, some faults are minor, some can be quite serious. Lights can be flickering, dimming, sparking, turning on and off by themselves, and these can be signs of potentially a serious electrical problems. Troubleshooting a lighting fault. First, always change the lamp. That's a great idea. Most of the time, if a light doesn't work, it's a faulty light. Simple, right? I just changed the lamp. Although, in saying that, as uh, LEDs become more and more common, and fluoros and incandescents less and less common, then uh, actually faulty lamps will become less and less common. Uh, so we get as much information about the problem as possible. Has only one light stopped working? Has anything else, like an electrical stop it, socket, stopped working? Um, you know, that's a great, those are great questions, right? And there's so much information contained in those. Uh, has only one light stopped working? Well, if Yes, if it's only one light stopped working, especially if that light's on the same circuit as multiple other lights, well, it's probably that light. Uh, if more than one light stopped working, like all the lights in the lounge, okay, well, then it's probably not each, every single lamp has not failed at once. That's That would be weird. It's possible, but it would be weird. So then I'd be looking at maybe there's a switch, maybe that switch that controls the lounge light. That would be the, the thing I'm looking for. Has anything else stopped working, like an electrical socket? If they go, oh yeah, all the lights in um, all the bedrooms, or uh, the lights and power in the lounge, or, or in the kitchen, 
then okay, now I'm probably looking at uh, looking for an MCB, right? Because now two different circuits have both stopped working. So something else further back that's turned off that has caused the problem. Uh, always check out RCDs and MCBs or fuses um, because it's it's literally uh, a 10 second job, right? So go to the switchboard and just have a quick look at all the MCBs. Are they all in the same position? Are all the RCDs and MCBs uh, turned on? Uh, are the fuses good? I can just pull a fuse out and do a quick um, test with my multimeter or often if it's a rewirable, I can see whether it's blown or not. Those are great ideas, right? That's great fault finding. Um, because it only takes you five seconds and it can save you um, lots of time mucking around with something that's not faulty. Uh, light switches and dimmers can cause light problems, so don't forget to check the switches and the dimmers. Um, we can always do, you can do a quick test with your multimeter across the switch. Is there voltage going into the switch? Is there voltage coming out of the switch when I flick it on? Simple. Uh, lights generate a lot of heat. If the lights are recessed, ensure there is enough space for the heat to dissipate. Um, and the particular problem we would probably have there is faulty connections, like we're burning out connections. Uh, and then in particular for fluoros, do the ballasts smell burnt? Do the ballasts smell burnt or show signs of burning? So open up that, um, open up that lamp fitting, uh, fluoro fitting, and if you see the ballast actually looks burnt, it's probably faulty. Okay, flickering lights. So again, uh, Always change the lamp first. That's a really important and useful thing. Just change the lamp. It doesn't cost you much and can solve, uh, save you a lot of heartache mucking around. Uh, some flickering of lights is normal, particularly when turning on other appliances. So if I flick the, uh, if I flick a, um, a big load on, that might dim the lights for a couple of seconds. Uh, we can get loose connections in the light switch or within the lamp holder, so it always pays to check all our connections. Uh, corroded or oxidized contacts. Contacts should look clean. Over time, contacts can corrode and oxidize and become black in color. Turn the supply on. Turn the supply to the light off. Scrape the lamp and lamp holder contacts with a screwdriver to clean them. Can you hear any buzzing from a light switch or any electrical circuit? Flickering lights are often a symptom of problems elsewhere. A buzzing noise from an electrical switch or a circuit is a sign of a problem. A buzzing noise is usually a sign of uh, a loose connection. So if the connection, the, the wire is moving around inside the um, terminal, then you're going to get a little bit of arcing in there and you'll hear that as a buzz. Bzz, bzz, bzz. Are there any abnormal smells coming from an electrical appliance or circuit? The cause of the smell could be the wiring overheating. Uh, this sounds ridiculous, but I'm I'm legit not joking. Uh, sniffing stuff is is a a, a genuine fault finding technique. If I'm looking at an um, electronic circuit board that I think is faulty, I have a look at it physically on both sides. Is there any burning? I will smell it. Can I smell any burning on there? If you've got burning on an electronic board, uh, you'll be able to smell it. There's a really distinctive electronic burning smell. And, uh, and if you can smell that smell, then you, 90% of the time, honestly, 90% of the time, there is a fault there. There's something, something has burnt out. Same lamp keeps blowing. Right, this is a really contentious one. I, uh, I treat people who tell me that, the same, that their, their lights keep blowing like I have to always replace my bulbs. Uh, I treat, generally treat that with a grain of salt. It's like... Um, you know, that's the kind of thing that my mum tells me. Oh, we've got bad electricity at our house because the lamps always blow. But the reality is there's, there's not really much that can go wrong that can cause all the bulbs in your house to blow continuously. You would have to have something really odd happening with just the power at your house and nobody else's for that to happen. Uh, maybe a loose fitting on the incoming a uh, loose wire on the incoming supply or something like that because it caused some arcing. But even that, it's just going to switch the lights on and lights on and off. Occasionally, it's not going to. It's, it's unlikely to uh, cause the bulbs to blow. And then you would you would notice other faults as well. You would notice all sorts of weird things if you had a, a faulty um, connection on your incoming supply. You know, power would switch off on various things. Uh, appliances wouldn't run properly. All of that kind of stuff. Uh, so the most likely cause is low quality lamps. Try a higher quality lamp or a long life lamp. So if you go 
you know, mum buys the cheapest lamps at the uh, supermarket, then yeah, you're yeah, probably going to blow. Uh, uh, something else actually that I tell people, particularly in modern houses, because modern houses we, we tend to have uh, multiple downlights in a single room. So in a modern house we might have uh, 30 to 40 individual lights, whereas in an older house you might have uh, 15 to 20. So we, we might have double or, or perhaps even more in a modern house. Now if we think about, uh, we do a quick calculation in our head that uh, a typical incandescent light will last around about a thousand hours. Now, if you're running your lights for maybe two hours a day, three hours a day, then that thousand hours is about a year's worth of lighting. It might be two years, so one to two years. Let's let's go with two years to be conservative. If I've got 40 lights in my house and they last on average two years each, Hang on, doing maths in my head. That means uh, I would have a lamp blowing about every about every twenty days. A little bit less than that, actually. Maybe maybe every two weeks, on average. So that might just it might seem to people like they're um, blowing a lot of bulbs. If they do their shopping once a fortnight, or even once a month, they might tell you what every single time I go shopping, I have to buy a bulb. Maybe sometimes two. You go, well, yeah, because you've got 40 lights in your house and you're using incandescent bulbs. That, that's the life cycle of a, one of those bulbs. To me, that's, honestly, that's the, the usually the, uh, that is usually the main cause. Usually the main cause is uh, you've just got a lot of lights and they don't last that long. Anyway, what else? Have you fitted a higher wattage lamp than you should? The lamp could be overheating and blowing. Try a lower wattage lamp. Is the light switch buzzing or discolored? A buzzing light switch or discoloring is a sign of a faulty switch. A switch may be causing the lamp to blow. Loose wiring in the bulb holder or the light switch could also do that. Uh, again, corroded or oxidized uh, contacts, the same as the last slide. Clean up the contacts. Uh, but honestly, most of the time when people say that their lights keep blowing, uh, it's they're dreaming. Just leave me alone, mum. You don't know what you're talking about. Sensor lights, right? Sensor lights can fail due to moisture problems or be affected by a power spike. This may cause them not to work at all or to stay on all the time. A damaged sensor light cannot be repaired. It will have to be replaced. Uh, yeah, sensor lights and weather, I guess they go together, right? Anything that's going to be outside, um, water damage is probably our most likely cause of the fault. Heat damage. Lamps with a screw-in type base can sometimes get stuck in the threaded lamp holder when trying to screw them out. You can actually be spinning the whole lamp holder and twisting the wires behind it. That does happen, actually. Uh, this is a dangerous situation as wires can break or have the insulation damage, which could result in a short circuit or even an electric shock for the person trying to change the lamp. The fittings that are more susceptible to this problem are surface mount spotlights, which take an incandescent reflector lamp. The lamps produce a lot of heat and can weld themselves into the lamp holder over time. So uh, causes, so there's some causes of heat damage, indications of heat damage, uh, particularly on that type of fitting. You'd see um, discoloration and uh, deformation of the fitting itself. You can see the plastic um, starting to uh, deform or become discolored, turn black and brown. Water damage. Uh, water in an outside light fitting, just as we talked about with the security fittings, that's a pretty common source, especially have, if you have a, uh, an RCD protecting that circuit. Get a bit of water in there, a little bit of moisture, can you just get a small current flowing down to earth and the RCD is going to trip. Um, it may not be uh, a problem to the light, that small amount of light, uh, water in there, may, the light may work perfectly normally, but uh, the RCD is going to trip. So in this case, turning the light off might not solve the problem, as the RCD can still detect a fault. So if the light was on, if the um, if the fault was on the other side of the switch, we, we still might get um, we still might get the RCD tripping even with the light turning off turned off. Uh, actually, turning turning a light off or turning individual things off on a circuit, just as a general point about fault finding, that's a great idea. If you've got a circuit breaker that keeps tripping and you don't know what's causing it. Unplug everything that's on that circuit. Turn off everything that's on that circuit. Turn the, um, turn the circuit breaker back on or RCD back on. And if it works, if it stays on, that's good. Then I go around and I turn on or plug in every individual thing on that circuit one at a time. 
And when the RCD trips again, then I know whatever it is that I just turned on, that is the thing that's faulty. You have to go back and check the RCD after each thing that you turn on, right? So it's particularly useful in a kitchen, right? The RCD is switching off in a kitchen. Well, we've got a toaster in there, we've got a jug, we've got an oven, we've got a microwave, we've got a dishwasher, we've got a, um, a range hood, uh, you've got a waste disposal, all sorts of stuff that's in there. It can be quite tough to tell what is the thing that's causing the fault. So turn everything off, unplug everything, just reset that circuit breaker, and then go around and plug your things back in one by one. Old wiring. Old cable with crumbling insulation could cause similar problems. Other electrical items that may be connected to the lighting circuit, including exhaust fans, exhaust fans and sweep fans, and air transfer fans. If you can't find a fault with your lights, it may be a fan causing the problem. Right, yeah, so old wiring is a good one. Uh, the old rubber stuff like pre-1950s, that's horrible. Avoid it like the plague if you can. Generally, as soon as you touch it, the insulation starts to fall off. Once the insulation falls off, then you're, you're pretty much obliged to replace that cable, right? You can't put a cable, can't re-screw a socket or light switch back on the wall if you know that the insulation on the cable behind there is, uh, is failed, is fallen off. Um, yeah, fans, so, so air transfer kits or, um, or you get your, um, the, uh, the multi, multi-purpose, multi-function units in your bathrooms. So they'll have like a heat lamp and then a normal light and, uh, and an exhaust fan. Sometimes it's the fans that's causing the problem. It may not be the light at all. So the fan is tripping the RCD. Um, and sometimes it might not be obvious that a fan is on your lighting circuit. If it's like an exhaust fan, uh, what do you call it, heat transfer kit or something, that, that fans up in the ceiling, you, you might not even uh, know that it's there. Uh, rodent damage is, uh, is legit. Um, mice and rats will, will chew cables. They, um, uh, all, all rodents, biology lesson, uh, all rodents, uh, their front teeth continue to grow throughout their life and they need to chew stuff to keep their um, teeth worn down and uh, insulation on cables is particularly uh, attractive to them. Uh, it's always fun when you're trying to find a fault and you uh, eventually track it down to, uh, you know, a big bite taken out of a cable and there's a, there's a dead rat there with, um, with his mouth wrapped around the phase wire. It happens. Uh, downlight problems. Downlights may flicker or not work at all if you fit low wattage lamps. For instance, 20 watts instead of 50 watts. Downlights usually have transformers to reduce the supply voltage. If changing a lamp does not fix it, uh, try changing the transformer. Downlight transformers generate heat and heat has to be dissipated. Ensure there is enough space around the transformer to dissipate the heat. Is something covering the lamp housing, for instance, insulation, overheating causes many different problems. So we shouldn't have uh, insulation over the top of our lamps. Uh, dimmers may cause downlight problems using the correct dimmer for the downlight. So all of those are pretty straightforward things. Let's take those for what it is. Uh, fluorescent lights, right. Fluorescent lights are important. Okay. Some fluorescent light needs, some fluorescent tubes need starters to work. Change the starter if changing the tube does not fix the problem. Do you have the correct starter? Different length fluorescent tubes require different types of starter. Fluorescent tube black or discolored near the ends is a good sign that the tube has failed or is close to failing. Not starting at all is also a sign the ballast has burned out. Right, I just want to cover a couple of things on there. Give me a second, I'm just looking at my other screen. Okay, so remember, uh, we have talked about how a fluorescent light works, and there are multiple things in there. Fault finding fluorescent lights is quite important, even though they're less common than they used to be, especially in new installations, there are still a lot of existing ones out there. So if we come across these things, now listen carefully because it's probably going to be in the test. If you come across a fluorescent tube where the ends are glowing, but maybe the tube flickers or doesn't do anything, but the ends are glowing orange, that is a faulty tube. That is a faulty tube. That means that we're getting voltage on the tube, but it's not striking the arc. Uh, if we have a, uh, if the ballast is black or discolored, then it's probably the ballast. If you see the starter is glowing, normally when it starts, the starter will glow and then it'll flick off. That's our, um, 
remember our little bimetal inside the starter is going on and off and each time that it opens it's giving that voltage pulse the ballast the magnetic field on the ballast collapses and that gives a voltage pulse across our tube if the um, starter is just sitting there glowing the whole time and it's not flickering on and off then the starter is faulty um, it's not opening it's not opening so it's not giving the voltage pulse Yep, those are the most important things there. Now, often if you find uh, if you find a tube just flickering, just flick, 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 that um, may be the starter as well. Um, oftentimes, just replacing the starter will um, will fix that fault. Uh, how to stop LED lamps failing early? Compared to old style halogen or incandescent lamps, LED should last an age. Some have lifetime claims of up to 25,000 hours. That's more than 20 years if you have them on for three hours a day. And three hours a day is probably actually pretty high uh, for a lot of lights. Um, a lot of lamps in rooms that you don't use often. I mean, maybe your, your lounge, kitchen, uh, you might have them on for three or more, five or six hours a day. Uh, in the winter, in the summer, you probably don't. You know, summer, it's light until eight, nine o'clock. So you might only run turn your lights on even in those areas for one or two hours. Uh, and your bedroom, probably an hour or two at the most because you don't, you're not sitting in your bedroom usually uh, all night. Uh, hallways, bathrooms, uh, places like that, you wouldn't even get an hour a day. You wouldn't even have them an hour a day. If you think about it, 25,000 hours, uh, that's long, you know, the, the fitting would be falling apart before the lamp stops working. Nevertheless, one of the most common reasons for early burnout of LEDs is putting LED lamps into light fittings that still have some old style light lamps in them. LEDs are designed to dissipate the relatively small amount of heat that they generate compared to old style lamps. However, they can struggle with very high temperatures. If they are put in close proximity to much higher wattage light lamps or in an enclosed fitting, it may lead them to fail early. Best way to prevent this is to replace all of the lamps in a fitting at once rather than as they blow. This will significantly reduce the risk of overheating and the light output will look more consistent too. So we're talking about fittings, particularly hanging fittings, that sort of thing that might have more than one bulb on it. So if we're putting um, LED bulbs next to incandescent bulbs, then the heat from the incandescent can f affect that LED. And the last sentence there says that the light output will look more consistent too. So you can get the same, like if you go for a warm white LED, that will mimic the, the color of an incandescent light, but every light's going to be a little bit different. So when you put those LEDs next to an incandescent, you will see the difference. It will look different and it looks weird and stupid. So it's a good idea to replace all of those at once. Okay, that is the end of the slideshow. Uh, I need to give you the code for the, the second part of the code for the test and it is Wait one moment. Four two. So I, I told I said the first two digits earlier in the video. The last two digits are four two. Now I do just want to talk about the test. So the last question on the test uh, is uh, a written question. It's, it's it's not marked by Canvas. You will have to write that, and I will have to um, and mark it for you. It uh, it asks you to talk about there's a picture there and it asks you to talk about uh, how you would no it asks you to talk about the viability of repair so it's a fluorescent fitting uh, what i'm looking for there is that you have uh, made an assessment about the um whether you can get hold of a replacement component the question says uh assess it says, assess the viability of repair, write a brief explanation of each point. Each point is component availability, cost and time of repair, cost of replacement. So what I want you to tell me is, can you get hold of the parts? What will they cost? And how long is it going to take to repair it? And so make a judgment based on what you think an hour of labor would be worth and how many hours it might take you to do that. I'm not going to mark you down if you say, oh, it's going to take me five hours and I'm not going to turn around and say, no, it'll take 30 minutes. Wrong. Uh, you make that assessment. Uh, and then work out what the cost of replacement is. And what I want you to tell me is, uh, is it worth repairing or should we replace it? So you need to know what 
what parts you're going to need to repair it, roughly how long that'll take to replace, or um, what the cost of that would be versus cost of replacement, and then you know actually time to install the replacement as well. So that'd be a written question. Write a little report on that. Shouldn't take you more than 20 minutes, I would say, or maybe half an hour. Uh, and when you submit the test, I will mark those. I, I'm going to mark these a, you know, reasonably harshly. I expect more than one, you know, one sentence per point. Often uh, when we do these type of questions, that's the answers that you give me. Uh, but hey, I've got a lot of time up my sleeve at the moment, so I can sit here and read these things and mark them. So uh, I'm going to expect a decent, a decent answer from you. Uh, that's the end of this topic. As I said, there's only going to be one video. It is done. Uh, I will leave you to it. As ever, let me know if you have any questions. Come back to me. Um, happy to help out. Thanks.